Uh, and I'm going to hand the meeting over to our speaker, June Mendo, as I was saying. She's, uh, she's five months new in the job. She is an excellent speaker and an excellent listener. And I think she is going to um, exercise some of those skills tonight. So June, take it away. Thanks so much, Brent. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, reading it loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks so much for the intro, the, the, the introduction, Brent. Um, great to see you again. And, and it was also a real pleasure to see a number of folks from the South Coast chapter at our statewide gathering of chapter leadership this weekend. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm assuming that not everyone is a South Coast chapter. Not everyone is deeply versed in what CNPS does. And so that's how I've organized this presentation. I may be telling you things that you already know, but we may also have um, some visitors here in the mix. Um, I'm not going to be able to see everybody while I'm presenting, so we're going to have a lot of time for discussion at the end, but I also encourage people to just unmute yourselves and jump in if you have a question. I am not a terribly fast speaker, so hopefully you can actually just, you know, find a gap and jump in if there's okay. anything you want to ask. June, I'm going to jump yeah. in and let you yeah. know that um, your speaking notes are also visible to us. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, maybe you shared your screen instead of sharing. Sure. Uh, Thanks for letting app me or know. Something. Yeah. So try. You can. I wasn't offended. I just wanted to let. No, you... no, no, no. I appreciate you letting me know. I had those in the background in case I needed them, but clearly they weren't in the background. So let's see. I'll try this again. And how is that? Uh, looks good okay and then if i do this let's see are you still seeing speaking notes no okay great thank you well um my plan this evening is to speak for about 20 minutes max maybe even a little shorter that and then shorter than that and then shift to an open question and answer session i really was hoping that we could have more of a conversation this evening. I, I um, asked Brent if we could try to approach this as a town hall. Um, as the new statewide CMPS executive director, I'm really excited to hear what's on your minds. Um, and so as I launch into this talk, I'm gonna maybe do something that's a little bit unusual. I'm gonna start by inviting you all to close your eyes and this will just be for a minute or less, so. I'm going to ask you to imagine a future for California where we've protected nature where it's most threatened. We've put a stop to the extinction crisis, and at the same time, we've increased our resilience to climate change. Imagine that native plants are the default in home gardens in our communities. Native plants blanket our parks, our roadsides, and other public spaces, providing beautiful water-wise landscapes that support our native insects, birds, and other wildlife. And imagine that people of all backgrounds have access to nature's benefits. We share a sense of belonging in the conservation movement, and we all see ourselves as part of nature. Well, we don't just have to imagine this future, and I'll invite you to open your eyes again now. For decades, the California Native Plant Society's work has been bringing us closer to this vision, and I believe that our work has never been more important than it is today. Today, humanity faces a couple of existential crises the sixth mass extinction on the history of our planet. And if you look closely at this graph, which shows trends in extinction over time, you won't see plants. And so I'll just say that the rates of plant extinction have been lower than they are for the other kinds of organisms represented on this chart. But if you lump together the total numbers, if you look at the total number of species that have been documented to go extinct over this time frame. Plants are about twice as many, um, the number of species that we have lost that are plants are about twice as many as birds, mammals, and amphibians combined. Of course, we're also facing climate change. 
So these two crises, crises of extinction and climate change, while daunting, also present real opportunities for us to accelerate and strengthen our work and the impact of that work. As Albert Einstein once said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. So I'm here today to talk about opportunities. I'm here to highlight some reasons to be optimistic about our work. And I'm here to ask for your help in getting even more people excited about and engaged in our work to increase the protection and appreciation of native plants. The first reason for optimism that I wanna talk about is that there's broad and expanding awareness that we have something really special and worth saving here in California. The second reason is that we're seeing major changes underway in how we think about our relationship with nature here in California and globally. And these changes and how we see, these, see the world, these paradigm shifts are magnifying and accelerating opportunities for positive change. And the third reason is that we have the people, knowledge, and tools in California to protect what's most threatened. So let me say more about each of these. The first reason for optimism I highlighted is that we have broad and growing awareness that we have something worth saving in California. In California, we have the world's oldest and tallest trees, super blooms that can be seen from space and oaks that support thousands of other species. But what's special here goes far beyond a few iconic plants, however spectacular. The state of California is part of the California Floristic Province. This is one of 36 global biodiversity hotspots. Together, these hotspots cover 2.5% of the planet, and they support 50% of endemic plant species, in other words, species that are only found in a particular place. These hotspots also support 40% of endemic bird, mammal, reptile, and amphibian species. So again, this 2.5% of the planet is supporting 50% of endemic plants. This means that protecting global biodiversity requires special attention to these biodiversity hotspots. And here in California, again, we have the people, the will, and the tools to provide that special attention. I want to talk a little bit about what makes California a biodiversity hotspot. Our biodiversity, as you may know, is largely made up of our plants. We have 6,500 types of native plants here in California, about 6,500 types. One third of those are found nowhere else on earth and more than one third are rare. Why do we have so many types of native plants? This has a lot to do with our geologic history and our climate. Over the past billion years, the western edge of what is now North America has seen tremendous geological activity. As pieces of the Earth's outer crust stretched and slid under each other, they formed deep basins like the Central Valley, carved out the San Andreas Fault, and pushed pieces of ocean crust to the top of what are today the Sierra Nevada. Today, our geology, soils, and landforms are incredibly complex and diverse. Our landscape and climate diversity have in turn fostered an exceptionally high degree of biological diversity. And as a result, our natural heritage is unique, rich, and has global significance. But today, California hangs in the balance. A century of wildfire suppression coupled with climate change has left our forests vulnerable to catastrophic wildfires. Sea level rise threatens sensitive coastal habitats and only a fraction of our original grasslands remain intact. Habitat conversion and fragmentation, wildfires, and the introduction of non-native species have all contributed to species loss. In total, much of our biodiversity is under threat. So we know that we have something special here and we understand that it's under threat, but that knowledge and understanding alone aren't enough to protect our biodiversity. And that brings to my second reason for optimism. We're at an inflection point, a change point in which views on conservation and land management are evolving in ways that are necessary for us to develop effective and sustainable solutions. 
So I want to talk a little about some of the large scale shifts in thinking, these paradigm shifts that are underway. The first is recognizing the importance of multiple forms of knowledge and understanding in our conservation efforts. Until very recently, much of the modern conservation movement had been rooted in a worldview that sees humans primarily as a threat to nature rather than part of nature. In this worldview, humans rely on nature largely for the economic benefits provided by natural resources and ecosystem services. This worldview assumes that quantitative scientific knowledge, things that we can measure, quantitative scientific knowledge is superior to other ways of understanding the world. Around the world, this way of thinking has often contributed to the adoption of laws and practices that have denied indigenous people access to and stewardship of their ancestral lands. That's certainly true here in California. Globally, this perspective has discounted the value of traditional knowledge held by indigenous peoples who can control one quarter of the world's land and manage 80% of its biodiversity. Here in California, it's also contributed to more than a century of wildfire suppression or wildfire suppression policies that have thrown our ecosystems dangerously out of balance. But today, we're seeing greater emphasis on developing conservation plans in partnership with indigenous peoples and incorporating traditional ecological knowledge and stewardship into conservation strategies informed by the best available science. California's wildfire and land management strategies increasingly recognize the role of indigenous stewardship, including cultural burning practices. California's Pathways to 30 by 30, a first in the nation strategy to protect 30% of lands and coastal waters by 2030, emphasizes tribal partnerships. The global biodiversity framework that nearly 200 nations signed at the United Nations Biodiversity Conference in Montreal in December also elevates the role of indigenous peoples in protecting nature and biodiversity. And at that conference, the international community adopted a global 30 by 30 target. And I wanna say a couple of things about 30 by 30 and I'll talk about it more later in this talk as well. 30 by 30, is a waypoint toward a global goal of protecting 50% of lands and waters by 2050. This is based on broad scientific consensus that in order to stem the extinction crisis and avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to protect 50% of lands and coastal waters globally by 2050. So 30 by 30 is a waypoint. It's an interim goal toward this 50 by 50 target. So I'll go back to talking about paradigm shifts. Another paradigm shift that's underway is related to the relationship between biodiversity protection and climate action. It's actually one of the drivers behind 30 by 30. In recent years, growth in clean energy and other areas of climate action have often generated tensions and trade-offs between climate resilience and biodiversity protection. An example of this kind of trade-off is the development of clean energy projects that impact sensitive desert or coastal habitats. As the climate crisis intensified, it seemed that the climate benefits of projects would increasingly be prioritized over impacts to biodiversity. But today there's growing recognition that climate action doesn't have to be at the expense of conserving biodiversity and nature. California's Pathways to 30 by 30 strategy is specifically designed to simultaneously protect biodiversity, enhance climate resilience, and expand equitable access to nature. Late last year, the United Nations Climate Change and Biodiversity Conferences, also referred to as COP27, the Convention of the Parties 27, and COP15, both explicitly acknowledged for the first time that biodiversity conservation and climate action are two sides of the same coin. We're also seeing other paradigm shifts underway. One incredibly important shift is what I'll call the habitat revolution in gardening. An increasing number of people are thinking about gardening, not only in terms of beauty and food production, but also in terms of habitat value and water conservation. 
Native plants provide a water-wise alternative to lawns, as well as important habitat for birds, insects, and other wildlife. Native plant gardening is a hugely important area where CNPS is leading the state and the nation in our work in public education and advocacy. Our chapter native plant sales are a pillar of this work. For many people, a local CNPS chapter plant sale is their first real introduction to the beauty, habitat value, and water-wise nature of native plants. Statewide, our Bloom California campaign, this is a CNPS sponsored campaign, is wrapping up this year with more than 120 partner nurseries and organizations participating. This campaign has driven a significant increase in native plant sales in participating nurseries. Our goal was to see an increase of sales of 30% and we're actually closer to 70%. We're currently upgrading our CNPS CalScape online platform, which provides the public with information on locally appropriate native plants. If you hadn't, haven't had a chance to explore that website, you can find it at calscape.org. And we're excited that we'll be rolling out a major upgrade of that this fall. And at the state level and the local level, we're exploring exciting opportunities for strengthening requirements for planting native species. We have a lot of chapters working on local ordinances and our central office um, in Sacramento is working on a state level um, effort. Okay, so I've talked about two reasons for optimism. Again, the first is this increasing awareness that we have something worth saving in California. And the second is these major shifts that are underway in how we think about our role as humans in nature, the relationship between biodiversity protection and climate action, and the importance of native plants in the built environment, in other words, in urban areas. A third reason for optimism is that in California, we have the people, knowledge, and tools to protect what's most important. California is now the fourth largest economy in the world. We just passed Germany. We have the economic resources and the political will to implement ambitious and needed conservation targets. We have one of the most advanced 30 by 30 strategies in the world. At COP15 in Montreal, the United Nations Biodiversity Conference I mentioned earlier, California's plan was highlighted by the international community as an example of what could be accomplished in other places around the world. We are a state that values diversity and is increasingly embedding equity in our policies across the board. And we have a vibrant environmental community that includes the largest native plant group in the United States, and that's us, CNPS. CNPS has been around since 1965, since our founding by a small group of activists in the Bay Area, we've grown into a statewide organization with 36 chapters, as I mentioned earlier, including one in Baja, California. We also have a central office in Sacramento, that's where I'm based, and more than 12,000 members across the state. We're a conservation group with an outsized impact, and that's mostly because of our extraordinarily passionate volunteers. If we were boxers, you would say that we punch above our weight. I've already talked about CNPS's role in native plant gardening, so let me say a bit more about some of the ways in which we're supporting conservation efforts under 30 by 30. CNPS has been partnering with state and federal agencies and other groups to map California's vegetation across the state. Mapping all of California's plant communities is a big goal and something that we could potentially accomplish together in the next decade. Fine scale mapping and vegetation monitoring are really important to understanding what plant communities are currently out there and how they're changing in response to extreme wildfires, drought, and other climate impacts. And of course, these plants, which we're focused on as CMPS, form the foundations of ecosystems upon which all of other life depends. CNPS is also helping to assess and prioritize California's native plant heritage by identifying and monitoring sensitive natural communities and rare plants. 
We're supporting the development of national and state seed strategies that will enhance the supply and use of appropriate native plant seeds in ecological restoration projects. Environmental reviews and project level advocacy efforts have always played an important role in CNPS's conservation activities. We're currently developing a conservation advocacy toolkit that will enable more people to participate in these efforts at a local level. So we're looking forward to rolling that out and working with chapters on that. And we've been a driving force in the strategy and communications of the Power in Nature Coalition. This is a statewide group of organizations, more than 60 organizations that are working together to support implementation of California's 30 by 30 strategy. CNPS also participated as the voice for plants in the extended California delegation to COP15 in Montreal. California actually sent a bigger delegation to Montreal than the US government. Strong international targets like the ones that emerged from COP15 help to reinforce the protection of what's most important here in California. Although we're having some modest national and international impacts, CNPS remains focused on our work in California and that the that most important work on native plants gets done at the grassroots level by volunteers like you. Okay, and before I move to my next slide, I should probably apologize here to Chris Sarabia. And I don't think Barbara Chung is on this call, but they didn't know they were going to be featured in this presentation. So, um, so I want to talk about the work of, of volunteers at CNPS. And here I'll highlight that I'm inspired by the work of volunteers like Chris Sarabia, our former CNPS board president, who of course leads the conservation work of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy through habitat restoration and preservation, native plant cultivation and seedling planting. The conservancy and a team of 1700 volunteers have supported the recovery of four at-risk species in the region. Those species are the El Segundo blue butterfly, the Palos Verdes blue butterfly, the coastal California gnat catcher, and the cactus wren. And Chris actually has an awesome story about a cactus wren, which he shared this past weekend. So if you haven't heard it, you should ask Chris about it. Um, I'm also inspired by Barbara Chung's work to promote container gardens. Barbara's education and outreach are helping to engage more people in the joy and benefits of native plant gardening. And if you haven't read her fairy tale guide to native plants, which is incredibly imaginative, I highly recommend it. So I'll close by thanking you for your time and your attention. And as I mentioned at the top of this presentation, I want to ask you to help us engage more people in our work. Our chapters and our volunteers are the strength of CNPS, and you are ambassadors for CNPS. For our work to be as relevant and sustainable as possible, we have to be able to engage all communities in our work in ways that are meaningful and inclusive. Whether you're a current member or someone who's thinking about joining CNPS, I'd love to hear your ideas for how we can do this better. For example, how can we connect with people and communities we haven't traditionally engaged with in our work? How can we elevate the roles of public education and outreach into all of our activities? There are so many good causes out there. I want to know what draws you to CNPS and how we can continue to earn your time and passion. How does it feel to be a part of the CNPS community? And how can we listen and learn more effectively as an organization? These are just a few starter questions, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and feedback as we move into the discussion portion of this evening. So thanks again, and I will stop sharing my presentation. And Brent, I don't know if I should turn things over to you or just ask people to either raise their hands or come off of mute. Well, I, I will say there was, um, when you showed the picture of those yellow flowers in that um, kind of that montane basin, there was a question that popped up from Dee. She said, they're beautiful, what are they? Oh, you're on mute, June. 
Thank you. That is a great question. I've committed I've committed the sin of putting something into my presenta presentation at the last minute and not being able to speak to it. So I will have to get back to, was it D who had the question? Right. With the species. Thanks, D. So let's see, if you would like to speak, you could um, raise your hand or just come off mute and ask a question. I'll, I'll ask if the CNPS has engaged with anyone in the ag community. Certainly there are corners of the ag community that would be receptive to um, our message. And I'm thinking hedgerows, I'm thinking riparian corridors that might run through their property, things like that. Yeah, that's a great question, Brent. And we have, and in addition to those opportunities that you're talking about there, I would also note that we undertook our Bloom California campaign. And again, this is a campaign where we've been working with nurseries across the state and other partners to increase access to native plants, um, you know, the commercial availability of native plants. And that was actually funded by an agriculture grant, uh, uh, a Department of Agriculture grant. And so in addition to increasing public awareness and appreciation of native plants and trying to increase demand for native plants in gardening, we're also doing some work with industry to help build the capacity of, you know, build industry capacity on the supply side. So we're thinking about this with a systems perspective, um, recognizing that, that, you know, we can't touch every part of the system, but really trying to both increase demand and then help increase supply as well of native plants. Is, is, there, is there room for experimental um, augmentation of agriculture by hedgerows? It seems like that would be, there's a body of knowledge out there and plus it would just mesh really well with your mission and rope in new converts, hopefully. If somebody feels like their fields are are getting better pollinated by the native pollinators, maybe they'll work to preserve the native hedgerow. That's a great point. So I think are you asking about the potential for more research on hedgerows, Brent? Yeah, I think I think it's a community that has money that is maybe looking for um, an olive branch rather than. Um, Rather than uh, being criticized for using too much water or something like that, so if they if they have something good to point to that's beneficial to them and beneficial to nature, I think they would they would go for it. At least some of them would. It seems like I would if I were in their shoes. Let me just put it mm -hmm. that way. That's a great point. Um, Chris writes in in the messages. He says uh, thanks for the shout out, June. He also adds that that volunteers play a huge role in all of the work we do, and we wouldn't be here uh, where we are without them, um, both PV, PLC, and CNPS. Mm -hmm. he's, he's keeping his camera off as he drives <laughs> home. Hopefully, he pulled over to the side to uh, text message that or used a text to speech or a speech to a text. Be yeah, thanks. thanks for the chat, Chris, and, and thanks for your gracious response. <laughs> Because again, I I didn't tell him I was going to put him in the talk. It's funny. Barbara was our speaker um, last week. Oh, um, okay. Or last month, I mean. Yeah. And um, she had a, an interesting perspective. I liked it a lot. Uh, you... Betsy is in chat. And uh, Betsy Calkin says, is there a path to learn more about native plant propagation? Yeah, Betsy, are you asking about um, activities at the state level or at the chapter level? Because I think I'm I'm curious if there are any chapter level activities that are happening, because often these kinds of, of, of learning opportunities are happening at the chapter level. Uh, well, I, I'll speak with my, my somewhat limited knowledge of everything that's going on in the chapter. Um, I think we don't do any plant propagation at, at the chapter level, but we have the, the land conservancy right mm -hmm. in, uh, in our chapter that does. And so I would kind of look to them as, as some local experts that you could, you could talk with. And it, That's it, right. might, it might well be that they would be willing to you know, show you their nursery practices. 
that, that's correct. This is Chris, and I'm, I'm parking now. So, um, uh, but if you go to the Land Conservancy website, you'll see there's opportunities to volunteer at our native plant nursery Monday through Friday. And it's such a great way to learn hands on um, all the names of your native plants, but really how to grow them and how to tend to them and uh, see them throughout the stages of life. So, I'd definitely uh, recommend um, you know, you sign up for our volunteer events and, and come out. All right, volunteering, that seems to be the word of the day. Kathy, there's that, also, um, uh, wrote just something. before we move on, um, there's also um, virtual workshops on the CMPS website. I don't know if they've done one on propagation specifically, but I know they do have a lot of different topics that they've done virtual workshops. Um, I'll try to post the link right now, but they might have something on there, so it's worth checking out. Thanks, Angel. All right. Kathy Zeitz loves Bloom and she loves Calscape. She, she says they're two awesome tools. Um, she says Bloom is exciting as it includes supporting nurseries and the certification program for both nursery and landscaping workers. Mm -hmm. She loves that you can just enter a zip code for plant listings and she refers people often. Uh, yes, and during Native Plant Week, like Bloom is gonna get a referral, um, you know, a referral every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for the feedback. We're excited about Bloom and Calscape too. And I mentioned that we're we're undertaking a major upgrade of Calscape. And so I think what you're going to see coming out this fall will be, it'll be even more useful and also just more beautiful. Um, I'm seeing a hand up from Jim Montgomery. Yeah, Jim, I just wanna thank you for this awesome presentation. I mean, I love your vision. I love your positivity. I mean, the reasons for optimism, I, I agree. But I also also agree with you about the, the twin crises of the climate, climate change and loss of biodiversity. So thank you for elevating that. And also thank you for elevating indigenous voices. You know, I think that's something we at CMPS have to have to do. You know, the merger of tech, T-E-K and T-E-C-H, you know, I think is beautiful, like, you know, a la Robin Wall Kimmerer in some of her writings. So everything said is just wonderful. I'm actually speaking next month. I'm uh, be talking about the Esplanade Bluff Restoration Project that uh, South Bay Parkland Conservancy is leading. And that's something that I'm dedicating a lot more of my life to is habitat restoration. I just think it's so critical. So I'll drop that um, project in the chat here for folks that are interested. And like I said, I'll be talking about it next April. So, but I just, I, again, I love your talk tonight. It just, everything about it resonated with me so much. Uh, so thank you. I'm glad you're um, where you're at. Thanks so much, Jim. I mean, thanks so much for the kind feedback. I'd love to hear your talk next month too. So oh, I'll keep an eye out for the information on the talk. I wonder, Jim, if I could ask you a little bit about, you know, what's motivated you to be involved in this kind of restoration work? That's a great question. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, Professor Connie Vadheim um, and actually Tony Baker um, and Tracy Drake at Madonna Marsh. Um, some number of years ago, and they taught me the love of California native plants. Um, and um, Tony helped me put in habitat um, in our yard uh, back in 2010. And um, it's just, it's just, yeah, that I love life. <laughs> I love the biodiversity of life. And like you say, 6,500 plants, right? Um, and as I tell the volunteers that come down to the bluffs in Redondo Beach, um, how many times in your life can you as a human being perhaps save an endangered species? And that's what we're doing with the El Segundo Blue um, down at the bluffs by, plan by planting, you know, sea cliff buckwheat, you know, so to me, to be a human being, to be life in service of life, you know, what, what's more beautiful than that? Thanks so much for sharing that, Jim. And maybe just a quick follow-on question. I see Adela. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Adela, but has a hand up as well. Uh, do you... For a lot of us, I think doing the kind of work that you're describing can feel very restorative, which I think at this moment in time when we're facing so many things in our world to be worried about can can really be a gift. And so I see you nodding your head. That, that, I mean, that was meant to be a question and not a statement, but. Um. It, it is. I mean, we've we've had like, you know, and the part I love too is just, you know, involving the youth. Uh, mm -hmm. Redondo Union um, High School kids have been down there, losing her. You know, and you just see the smiles on their faces, you know, reconnecting, you know, realizing that we're not, as you said, not separate from the natural world, but part of nature. You know, we're animals, part of this natural world. 
and some of these kids, you know, they, they've never had a chance to have their hands in the soil or to plant a plant. You know, um, <laughs> I remember a few of them came across a, uh, a potato bug. They were completely freaking out <laughs> by what this strange creature was in the sand. And it was just, I don't know, it's just, I get so much more out of it than I give, right? You know, um, and like I say, it's so restorative. It feeds my soul um, to have my hands in the soil. And, you know, we put in 80 native plants down at the beach just last Saturday with about 12 volunteers. You know, we're going to restore, we have a U.S. Fish and Wildlife grant um, to restore seven acres of habitat along the bluffs um, in Redondo. And my vision is eventually all two miles from King Harbor all the way to PV. You know, we're going to restore all of it. So it's going to be beautiful. And we're going to have a super bloom of wildflowers. <laughs> you don't have to go all the way to the Antelope Valley to see it. You'll be able to come right down to the Bluffs and Redondo and Torrance. That's so, amazing. Yeah. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Sure. No, it, it's, yeah, again, Tony, thank you so much. You and Connie and all the folks at Madonna Marsh, you know, I, I, I owe you so much. So thank you. Is it Adela? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> You've been so patient. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, I've had this concern for a while that <clears throat> I think there's uh, um, some kind of a movement by the, um, the energy um, department to, <clears throat> or whatever companies, to put in big swaths of solar um, sheets, um, cells out in the desert and other sensitive areas and that just doesn't make sense to me why don't they lease the rooftops of some businesses or something instead but is that a concern of uh uh that you've been aware of um that they would be putting these uh panels over sensitive deserts and that kind of thing yeah I, so i'm not sure if i'm answering your question adela but but it's citing where projects are cited, including the kinds of solar projects that you're talking about, is incredibly important to you, to the outcome in terms of biodiversity. And so, so that is a concern, and that is an area where there's a lot of a lot of that work is happening at the project level to to influence the decisions on where projects are cited. And that will continue to be an important area of work for CMPS, and particularly at the chapter level, I think. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add on to that a little bit. Um, when the solar thing was kind of um, being discussed at the state level, CMPS actually did put out quite a few um, resources for people to get in touch with their local representatives, letting them know that they shouldn't do that, that they should be renting out you know, that they should be incentivizing homeowners to put rooftop solars or to put them on businesses. So at the time, CMPS did have a pretty strong opinion and outreach on that. I think right now that proposal is tabled, but if it comes up, I'm sure they would, you know, put a lot of effort into it again. Thank you, Angel. And you're you're exactly right. I think from the state office, you'll hear the term state office or central office. You know, we'll we'll work on issues that are, you know, as you would expect at a state level, and we'll try to put out resources that chapters can use. I mean, oftentimes they they might be templates or kind of guidelines that chapters can adapt for local level work. Um, but the point that I'm getting at is that it's most powerful and most important for for decision makers, especially elected officials, to be hearing from their constituents. And so hearing from people at the local level, or hearing from, from local volunteers, I mean, that's really where, where you know, CMPS has the greatest influence. And so we can support and enable, you know, provide some tools from the office in Sacramento, but really it's the voices of, of volunteers, again, at the grassroots. Um, it's those voices that have the, the most power and resonance. Yeah, thank you for that, Angel, and thanks for yeah. the question, Adela. Yeah, I, I when with uh, Angel's answer, I just realized another thing. <clears throat> Are you um, uh, concerned about the fact that the incentives for solar panels on home rooftops is being pretty much evaporated <laughs> uh, come April fifteenth? So seventy percent of the uh, incentive will be removed. Uh, that to me is, seems counterproductive to 
trying to encourage people. That's for sure. And is that anything that you're aware of and have any lobbyists going for? You know, I'm not aware that we are actively engaging on that at the state level, but I'll go back and check on that as well. I mean, I think it is, I mean, it's it's a good point that that taking away those incentives is going to result in less people being motivated to to put solar panels on the roofs. So right. they yeah. won't be able to afford it. <clears throat> right. And they won't. And then that'll lead to more of this desert big panels that the uh, energy companies will put out you know, oh, over yeah. sensitive areas, yeah. There's, it turns out there's a, a link that uh, Angel posted in the chat to, uh, and the, the latest message is a link to um, a CNPS page on rooftop solar. So I guess there's a there's a position and it's out there and quite honestly, I'm not familiar with it, but the link is there. So <laughs> Adela, maybe go, in the chat, there's a lot of good links, but that one answers your question directly, I think. Yeah, the question of is is CMPS uh, doing something actively about that loss of the incentive coming up in April 15th of this year? Um, well, I just clicked on the link. It looks like it is um, generally in favor of roof, rooftop solar, but not specifically opposed to the loss of the um, incentive. Um, Cynthia well, was then, uh, to... I mean, then that's not practical. Would that be incentive? I mean, the thing that I'm worried most about is during the last proposal, they wanted to charge homeowners with rooftop solar panels, like 50 something dollars a month to have them, which I think is a bigger issue for me than them taking away the incentives. Like, I don't want to be paying because I wanted to help the environment. Hmm. All right. It sounds like sounds like there might be room for an opinion there, uh, at the state level. Um, certainly, certainly at the chapter level, we could talk to our local representatives. Um, Cynthia was writing that she seconds the thanks to Connie Vodheim, who had who had noticed from uh, Jim Montgomery, and then uh, Tony, who's on the call here, and Tracy. I presume he's Tracy Drake and Madrona Marsh. Um, he, uh, Cynthia says that she learned a lot from Out of the Wilds and Into the Garden, which was um, kind of a Connie Vodheim, Tracy Drake production and related activities. So yes, Connie is, is Miss, she's in Colorado now and uh, I emailed her a while back. I didn't get any response. Um, and then Jim was she lives in Colorado me. presently, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, Jim, Jim added that the, they're partnering with the, the local land conservancy, PVPLC, to source many of the plants that they're putting on at the bluffs, which is just a literal, literal stone's throw up the road. So entirely appropriate to be getting them from the land conservancy. 3,750 plants over the next three years. So that's quite a few plants, Jim. Uh, are there any other questions in the audience? Does anyone have a hand up that I can't see? I think Adela has her hand up again. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you had mentioned um, that uh, you're encouraging people to plant native, urban native gardens, uh, gardens in in their neighborhood that are native. And what did you put that in the chat um, where you can read more about that? I'm in an organization and we're trying to encourage our members to plant native plants and they have no interest specifically they're not native plant people so it would be like kind of kind of getting some enthusiasm or or some reasons to them so that they would want to even think about it mm -hmm. um well i'm not sure if this answers your question adela but we do have a lot of resources that we've put out uh, you know calscape is meant to be a tool to help make people help people make informed decisions about what to plant in their gardens. But probably in order to go to Calscape, you have to have some level of interest in doing that in the first place. So we do, I mean, we are doing a lot of outreach, a lot of education to try to increase awareness of, you know, the importance of, of planting native plants. Again, I talked about the idea of a habitat revolution, getting people to think beyond aesthetics, to also think about habitat value. And frankly, it's also, you know, 
for, for a lot of people, there's a, a gradual change that has to happen in terms of what we regard as beautiful in our gardens, because what people have often grown up with is different from, you know, what we see when we look at native plant gardens, which of course I think are beautiful, but they're, you know, everyone's idea of beauty um, may be a little bit different. So we're trying to, again, you know, increase education and outreach and, and provide a lot of good, free, easily accessible tools to the public to help people, you know, make informed decisions what, about what to plant, help people design gardens because people often don't know where to start. And so we've got some great tools um, available through that Bloom California campaign. We're linking more things to Calscape. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question, Adela, but. Yeah, you did. And um, <clears throat> you said a lot of outreach. Mm -hmm. I, I have two organizations I think would benefit from having a speaker. Do you have um, uh, availability of speakers to talk to the groups? Yeah, we um, we do have people who would be happy to speak. You know, I think from the state office, we do have a horticulture team and um, not that I'm volunteering them up, but I'm but I think they would be happy to speak to groups uh, as well, you know, outside of CNPS. And, and then I would also encourage folks within this chapter to um, to think about opportunities to engage and, you know, even as speakers or, or less formally with other okay. groups. Yeah. yeah, because this would be in person locally. Yeah. 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 I might add, um, we're uh, working on, uh, we actually talked tonight at the board meeting. Brent has been uh, working on helping us to create uh, program that we can present to to groups so uh, we should be up and running with that um, pretty soon uh, with um, if anybody out there in the meeting has pictures really nice pictures of, of your uh, native plant garden or somebody else's native plant garden and you want to send them to us um, that would be great so we could include them you know you, your garden could be included in our talk as well and if anybody out there wants to give talks, wants to volunteer to give talks, also could let us know. Oh, yeah. That would be a boon. Thanks um, so much, David. Um, sorry, Brent, did I cut you off? Oh, well, I was, I was about to say one thing, and then I saw that Cynthia had made a comment in the chat. So I kind of context switched to Cynthia, uh, who notes that there's this homegrown national park which is a concept founded by Doug Ptolemy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the concept is uh, part of the, the vision that you had for us when we closed our eyes in the beginning, um, which is that um, there's, you know, there's highways through your yard. And if every yard is a native plant reservoir, then, you know, the entirety of the, uh, of the growing world could be a, a national park. I think that's, the, the essence of that concept, but I, I kind of wanted to dwell and thank you a little bit more about uh, about having that the closed eye moment for us when you invoked a vision of, of how things should be or how how we wanted things to be, because if um, if you don't have a vision of where you want to go, then you you run the risk of being a little misdirected, I think, and um, the. The younger people I hang out with have a have a saying about memeing things into existence, by which they they mean that they they just they generate slogans and fun pictures and and uh, get have a you know internet uh, messages about uh, whatever they happen to think that that needs to be brought memed into existence or brought into existence by sheer force of will and and um, sort of um, social capital and. Um, so I think that's a similar concept that's that's shared among generations. Thanks for that, Brent. And Jim, I see you've been patiently waiting with your hand up. Well, that's fine. I'm enjoying hearing everyone else's comments. But I see Catherine had the question here about if CNPS had done any tracking on which reach outreach methods were and events were most effective. And I think that's an excellent idea. If we, you know, if we polled the entire CNPS membership about how you came to be you know, a lover of native plants. You know, I, I grew up in Michigan and I grew up growing food. You know, everyone had vegetable gardens. And my mantra was, if I couldn't eat it, I wasn't going to grow it. You know, and it wasn't until I came to California and got exposed to the Madrona Marsh, you know, where you actually got to see it. And then you got the classes, you know, that basically it was a paradigm shift. 
you know, and when I, you know, and, and Connie had her, your, your new California garden, right, which was, you know, getting away from the English garden concept of big lawns, you know, that we water with roses and, you know, California native plants, you know, and what's the things that matter to you. And for me, it was habitat, you know, value. I wanted to put in plants that maximize habitat, you know, but at the same time, think about, you know, pretty palette that people might appreciate as they walk by, you know, and so I, I think for me, that was how I, that was my entryway into native plants, having a place like Madonna Marsh with, you know, the plants that Tony and others put in there and the classes that Connie had, you know, that, that re repeated it, you know, once a month, every Saturday, we had a class. So maybe perhaps, you know, throughout California, we start having, you know, do what Connie did, right? And we have native plant installations and classes and giving people the tools um, and just making them understand, you know, like I was made to understand the beauty of native plants. But again, I think again, polling the membership, you know, cause I think we all came to it in different ways. And mm -hmm. that's, that's my journey. So I, I think we all probably have had our own, you know, individual journeys. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jim. I'd love to hear from others too about their journeys and what the, what brought them, you know, to to your love of native plants. What what has brought you to CNPS? Um, and I'm also looking at the chat here. Thanks, Brent, for responding to Kathy. Um, Leave is the right person to ask. Um, I think we've done a little bit of this, but we, you know, this this actually is a very difficult thing to measure. Um, which is not to say that we shouldn't do more to try to measure it. The question was about, um, has CMPS done any tracking on which outreach methods and events are more effective? And the tools are very welcome. So thanks for the question in the comment, Kathy. Um, you know, we're able to measure things like how many how many clicks do we get on a website or how many you know how many people register for a webinar, that kind of thing. Um, and then we can do some polling. To, to see, you know, subjectively what people think is most effective, but certainly have more work to do there. Yeah, June, if you don't mind, I'll share uh, my early story of why I think I'm, I like native plants. Please, yeah. And the, I was, uh, I, I grew up, my parents had a fairly large property and I had to do a lot of the labor to maintain it. And it was, you know, it wasn't groomed to the nines, but it, it was, you know, it required maintenance. And we had areas called the upper 40 and the lower 40, which weren't 40 of anything, but there was, the idea was they were just big and they needed to be maintained. So I didn't want any plants at all when I was a kid. I wanted no plants because of maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. And um, I had, I my mind uh, sort of changed and, um, and I decided at some point I wanted some plants. And that was could have been based on the fact that I spent um, a lot of those years when I didn't want plants, I spent hiking and backpacking in the uh, in the California foothills um, around Santa Barbara, where I grew up. And um, so I, I one reason that I wanted natives is because I saw a reduced maintenance schedule. Now, I've, I've kind of gotten past that now. I, I, I enjoy the maintenance part. But um, I thought to myself, well, reduced resources, reduced inputs, uh, you know, prune it, prune it once a year, let it do its thing. That's my style of plant. I want that plant. And that was one of the motivations I had for getting interested in native plants. So it was, it was a combination of high reward for low input because I, I saw the benefits of the ecological benefits and, um, and because I was, you know, kind of lazy, um, but also it was, um, you know, I wanted to reintroduce the native or the wild to the, the urban environment where I happen to, to live. Uh, and I think that was driven by the fact that I'd spent all that time I had access to the out of doors. So um, I think the theme, the theme I have here is, um, I think it was the access that let me appreciate native plants later in life early early life access. Thanks for sharing that, Brent, too. I um I I also got into the outdoors when I was, I mean, really when I was in college. And so I, you know, I, I talked to, to a lot of my colleagues at CMPS who talk about, you know, how they spent all this time in the outdoors and they were kids and they always loved 
gardening and wilderness or you know wilderness and these other things and I was I I grew up in the suburbs and I was a complete bookworm and didn't really get out and really explore the outdoors I did a little bit um for sure but I didn't really get out and really appreciate you know wilderness in California until I was in college I would say um and so we all we all have different paths to this work Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, I, it, I've been contemplating the access that I had and um, regretting that so many of you know the youth today, particularly in our built environment, don't have access to you know authentic native plant places, and they're they're around, but you have to find them, right? And but if, and if you were just going to Google a park in your neighborhood, it's probably not going to be the park that has the native plants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah that did I cut you off Brent I'm sorry no I, I paused while I was thinking a little bit so go ahead please I was just going to respond by going back to you know I, I talked about 30 by 30 quite a bit tonight and one of the goals of that 30 by 30 strategy is to increase equitable access to nature and so it's really something that the state is trying to contend with right now. It, it's a challenge to, you know, we have these broad goals. We say we're going to protect biodiversity and increase climate resilience and expand equitable access. Um, but knowing what are the right places that we need to protect, need to protect is, is really difficult. Right now we don't have interim goals at a state level. Um, a lot of this work is done regionally and, and I think really interim goals and criteria for what to protect would probably meaningfully have to be established at the regional level. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, there there is a risk with 30 by 30. And I, you know, I, I actually made this point in, in Senate testimony last Monday, because I was invited to testify on progress in implementing 30 by 30. I made the point that, you know, we run the risk of me of meeting our our acreage target for 30 by 30 like hitting we're saying we want to conserve this 6 million more acres uh, by 2030 in order to meet our 30 by 30 acreage target but but if we don't have clear goals and targets in the interim it's quite possible that we could meet that numerical target but fail to achieve our biodiversity goal and in particular fail to meet our access goal because Traditionally, a lot of our protected lands have been away from communities that are most climate vulnerable, away from communities that you know have, uh, you know have been have been historically disadvantaged. And so, so if we're trying to increase access to nature for those historically underserved communities and more climate vulnerable communities, we have to do things differently. So we need a pathway to get some of those lands that might not currently qualify for the highest levels of protection under 30 by 30, finding a way to get, you know, to basically have a bridge for them to be protected in the 30 by 30 network. And that may take, you know, funding for restoration activities or, or other kinds of, of measures to ensure durable protection. Um, so I think that that wasn't exactly your point, Brent, but, but your comments just, um, you know, reminded me of, of some of those really important efforts that are happening in parallel. You know, 30 by 30 really leads with a biodiversity goal, but the equity piece is incredibly important. And of course, this is also about enhancing our resilience to climate change and, and you know, avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. Yeah, uh, in addition to the LA River here in LA, there are other concreted drainages. And um, I, I guess I would suggest I would suggest them as linear parks or the, the edges of them. There is um, there is such a park space that was put in in uh, my old neighborhood of Hawthorne um, along the, what we call the Dominguez Slough there, but it was it a was mini LA River that with concrete bottom, concrete sides, but it had you know an access road and a dirt embankment uh, on the upper portion, which was um, planted along probably a, a maybe three quarters of a mile of its length. And uh, streets crossed it, of course. So it became a linear park that went between these two streets. And um, I thought, it, honestly, I thought it was magnificent. Uh, if we could see more of that, I mean, that is 
that's biodiversity, that's park, and that's that's instant access. That is a it's currently commute corridor. It'd probably be even a more important commute corridor for pedestrians and bikes. So um, I I would I would raise the hand for you know long narrow parks being you know appropriately vegetated. Um, being in consideration for part of the 30 by 30 um, census. Thanks. I think, I think those are also really cool because they they expose a lot more people to them. Um, I have two sisters who live in San Francisco and I think right now, I, uh, I don't know which chapter specifically is, um, man, is like, part of San Francisco, but I know along Sunset Street or Boulevard, they have um, these pretty wide parks and they used to be just grass. I think they had some pretty big mature trees that were taken down by the rains. So now they did a example native garden on one section and they hope to be able to do the entire length of Sunset connecting the Golden State Park and some nature preserve. So I think it's pretty cool because um, the metro passes right along the park. So people getting off of the bus stops have the opportunity to see these little mini native gardens. So I think your idea of like having long parks is also really cool because you have a lot more surface area that people can see. A lot more surface area, I agree. Thanks, Angel. All right. We've uh, we've gone for about uh, an hour or so. I'm wondering if there's uh, any more questions out there. If you needed a wanted to say um, any any concluding remarks, Jim's got a, a longer comment in the in the chat that just popped up, and uh, and which uh, maybe I'll I'll get to after I read Cynthia's comment. She says. Uh, she says you need an emphasis on preservation of urban area locations to provide access to underserved communities. It would be great to replace the oil fields with an expanded Kenneth Hahn Park. So yeah, locally we've got um, Baldwin Hills, which were um, extensively exploited for oil. A lot of that's been turned into a really great park, and there's you know there's adjacent oil fields that have yet to be converted. Um, but as the, as the wells play out, that's the obvious thing to put there is either houses or park. Um, yeah, th thanks for that comment, Cynthia. And, you know, that preservation of, of certain urban area locations, I mean, it's also regional parks, it's water district lands, it's recreational areas. I mean, those could be a part of the 30 by 30 network um, and really, again, help us to make progress in that equitable access piece. I mean, it, it depends. It's, it's all context dependent, right? And I don't know this particular... Um, I don't know where Kenneth Hahn Park is specifically, but uh, but I but yeah, I, I agree with the idea behind your comment, Cynthia. Yeah, Kenneth Hahn is these old played out oil fields in on the, in the Baldwin Hills, which is sort of um, it's north of here, kind of between um, Culver City and Inglewood, I guess. It's yeah. If you don't know those LA, then you wouldn't know those references, so uh, you're forgiven. <laughs> There, Jim's exactly. asking about high tech collaboration. Is there any sort of collaborations with NASA, mm -hmm. JPL? Um, in in his opinion, we are one of the world's premier institutions for earth and climate science, and I'm thinking there could be a lot of opportunity for our scientists, engineers, and remote sensing satellites to be of service in supporting 30 by 30 and other initiatives initiatives to address the climate crisis and loss of biodiversity. So, what about the high tech connection? Jim, do you work for NASA JPL? I do. Okay. I, but I'm I'm more on the uh the solar space or solar exploration stuff. I work on Mars missions. So, but I I have a lot of colleagues that do earth and climate science. Mm -hmm. And if there's no connections between CNPS and our earth and climate science folks now, I could definitely make those connections. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think of things like our SMAP remote sensing, it's that soil moisture active passive, right? That looks like vegetation and, and moisture around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, that could, I could see that being of use of, you know, as we have projects to try and revegetate and rehabitate and restore habitat, right? You could see the before and afters. So 
that's a, that's my question. Is CNPS already plugged into working with researchers from NASA and JPL? You know, not to my awareness, but there's so much that I'm not aware of. I mean, I think I've made that evident tonight that, you know, there's a lot that's going on that I, that I only have a limited, you know, that I only have limited insights into. I actually have been wondering about both NASA JPL and NASA Ames. So I'd love to follow up with you separately about that, um, Jim, if that would be okay. Because I agree with you that I think there's great potential there. Certainly. I think, could you direct your email and chat and I'll reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be glad to hear from, from anyone else as well. Yeah. And actually, you know, yeah, since, can, can I say one last thing? Actually, now that I think about it, so there's in talks about opportunities for like large chunks of land. There's the AES Redondo power plant that's going to be going out of service here soon. And I, I do know the state of California and the state of Redondo is trying to make a bid for it. It's going up for public auction actually soon. And I don't know if CNPS has weighed in on um, supporting that activity to, you know, we want to acquire it and actually restore habitat, open space, parkland, that kind of stuff. And I was reading an article recently about this thing called One Redondo, where the, instead of that vision that we have, it's a vision to like basically build a mini city there with a lot of development. So I don't know if that's on CNPS's radar and are we weighing in on that at all? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, and it, in a lot of cases with these local projects, we're, you know, it's the, it's, it's our chapters who are the censors who are getting this on CNPS's radar. So, um, you know, I'll go back and, and talk to Nick Jensen, who directs our conservation program, and I'll ask him specifically about this project, but um, we'll also, you know, be continuing to look for insights from, from you and from others in the chapter. Okay, well, that might be a question then for the local SCC and PS folks. Or, or is that on our radar here? Uh, it all? is. It is not on our radar. So, but um, maybe it should be. So, um, let's continue that conversation uh, elsewhere. Okay, Brent, I'll reach out to you. Okay. Um, Tony writes he got into native plants early because the hill was our playground. The hill is the the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And, and I would come home smelling like sagebrush and our fort was under an ancient lemonade, <laughs> lemonade berry. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's nice. But, and then June dropped her email into, into the chat. And uh, that sounds, that looks like about the signal for a, to call it an evening. A call for any last words. Thanks so much. Brent. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to just hold space just for a little bit here to see if there are anyone, you know, I, I'm always trying to make room for the quiet voices. And sometimes there are people who are a little more reserved about raising a question or making a comment. So we can just wait for a bit here. Subjecting everyone to an awkward silence. Well, not seeing seeing any hands or oh, hearing. I have a question. Oh, yes. Um, uh, at the beginning, it's a slightly unrelated, but um, I was kind of in and out of the meeting earlier. But um, did you say you lived in eighty different countries? I I have I have been to more than eighty countries, but I have not lived in eighty different countries. Wow. But I um, I worked for that was mostly because of my government service. A little bit of that was personal travel. But I worked for um, I worked for organizations in the U.S. government that had responsibility for U.S. activities in Africa mm -hmm. and in Latin America and the Caribbean. So there was a a portion of my life, more than ten years, where I'd spent you know at least two weeks out of the month living out of a suitcase. Mm, wow. And all of this, um, some of you may have heard me say this before, but all of this has really strengthened my belief in California's exceptionalism, you know, working around the world and, you know, working with partners really, um, you know, around the world as well, it just has, has strengthened my belief that we really can do things here in California that either seem impossible in other places because the challenges are too daunting or, you know, but here I just feel like there's so much, we have we have the right dose of you know energy and idealism. We have resources um, here in California that we just most of the world doesn't have. So, all right. D D says thank you for your kind and measured presentation tonight. Um, she sends her best to you, 
as you begin Thank your you. um, executive director uh, tenure at the CNPS. And uh, Jim said something similar. Chris, yeah. Chris sends a heart. <laughs> thank you for sharing space with us tonight. Thanks, Chris. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to to connect with you this evening, to hear from many of you. Um, I appreciate your patience with me because I am the new kid and there's so much that I don't know and I couldn't answer most of your questions, but I'm committed to continuing to learn, um, you know, would love to continue to hear from you and, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Well, thank you very much, June. And I think that's a wrap for us. Thanks, everyone. All right. Good night. I'm going to respond to Ed Kimball's question. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Hi, hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you much. All right, good night everyone.